where we put money, you know, where we determine where money is going to flow is, is going to determine the kind of world that we build. And mm-hmm. you know, at the moment, you know, and for many decades prior to this moment, we've had a very unequal um, distribution of where funding flows, which, which means we're only going to solve certain problems. We're only going to tackle certain challenges. We're only going to innovate in particular ways because of a particular demographic with a particular viewpoint, with a particular vision of our, all of our futures. And so for me, it's absolutely critical that we think about investing diversely and not just gender, but race and geography also, mm-hmm. because people are going from different places with different eyes, with different backgrounds, from different races are going to solve different problems. Welcome to Care More, Be Better, a podcast for people like you who care about the social impact of conscious companies and everyday heroes. Hear inspiring stories from those who put people and planet before profit and personal gain. You'll learn how you can make a difference, vote with your dollars, and get involved today. Here's your host, Karina Belizzi. Hello, fellow do-gooders and friends. I'm your host, Karina Belizzi, an activist and cause marketer who's passionate about social impact and sustainability. So passionate, in fact, that I even created a five-step guide to help you unleash your inner activist. If you're curious, all you have to do is join my newsletter. Go to caremorebebetter.com and click the button to join our newsletter. Again, that's caremorebebetter.com or you can always just send me a DM on social platforms and I'll send it right over to you. Now, today we're going to talk about something near and dear to my heart, and that is really the need to have great funding for ventures that are female-led and minority-led. And to do that, I'm going to be joined today by Sarah Dusak. Sarah Dusak is a venture capitalist and co-founder of Enigma Ventures, a venture capital fund. She invests in women-led businesses in Southern Africa, creates solutions to wealth disparity, and provides access to capital for women. In 2017, after successfully selling her company under Canvas, For more than $100 million, Sarah launched Enigma Ventures. Sarah, welcome to the show. Thanks so much, Karina. It's great to be here. It's great to have you here. So let's get right into it. I have a couple questions, um, but one that really kind of stood out to me to start our conversation was simply this. Um, I would like to know what it was like that first time that you had to pitch somebody for money to support your idea. I figure that by talking about that, um, it will help our audience understand perhaps why you have chosen to to launch this venture, Enigma Ventures. Thank you. Yeah, that's a great question. What was it like the first time I pitched? Well, I had no idea about how to pitch um, and how to write a deck. Um, Businesses, rather than, we'd all heard about this idea of building business plans, right? And that you'd go to the bank with your business plan. And I think that is is as much info as I had about this whole idea of (laughs) trying to raise money for your business. And I quickly learned that building a business plan to give to a bank is very different than pitching your business to a potential investor. Um, Mm. And I was privileged enough to have encountered um, a female VC who actually stayed at one of our camps in the very early years of of our business. And she said to me, you know, this is a really great concept. You really should start pitching to VCs to see if you could raise more capital. I had no idea what she meant. I had no idea what that looked like. And uh, she was kind enough to start to give me some of the parameters around how to do that and Mm -hmm. how to build a pitch deck that investors would expect to see. Now, if she'd never done that, I would have had no idea what should go in that. Um, So there's there, what I, I guess the the conclusion of that is there is hope if you don't know today <laughs> how to do that um, there is hope for discovering uh, what that looks like and and the, the things that are really critical to include but it, it was a scary journey because it was using language 
I really was unfamiliar with and terms and concepts that were not on my radar at all. Hmm. Well, I, having been through my MBA course load, we had plenty of chances to practice and in some cases even brought in, you know, five heads of VCs and the class were separated into groups and we each had to pitch our idea and get feedback and there would be a, a winning venture, so to speak. I mean, all funny money, just, you know, <laughs> fake, so to speak, but it was really powerful because it helped us understand what they'd be looking for and the things that you mm. would leave out, like that founders sometimes yeah. think are really important, but that is just noise to them. And so I think it's so, yeah. it's just such an interesting thing. I, I also believe that many people don't understand the resources that are available to them. Like several universities that have business mm -hmm. centers often have accelerator programs for their graduates. And even if they didn't go to the business school, right? Like they could have a degree in anthropology, but they're, you know, like I did, right? There are accelerator portions at UC Santa Cruz where I went for my undergrad that I didn't know about because I hadn't gone to business school and a business school didn't teach me those things. Now I have those in my back pocket. I understand if I'm ready to go get money from a venture capital, the basics of what I would need to do to get there. Now, who knows if I'd be successful mm -hmm. out the gates? I might have to pitch to like 30 different companies or 30 different ventures because that's often how it goes. But, um, you know, we just don't necessarily get the tools we need when we're getting started. Yeah, it, I mean, knowledge is power, right? Um, if you have the knowledge how to do something, you're part of the way there. Um, so understanding, you know, the, the rules of how something works um, is a really powerful way to arm yourself, to enable mm -hmm. you to, um, and to achieve what you're trying to achieve. Right. So having been through an exit now, you had that hundred million in your back pocket, able to go figure out what you were going to do next. You did put a portion of that into this VC. And so I'd like for you to talk about perhaps a few of the companies that you're currently funding and where they are at the process as a relatively new venture. Well, maybe I should clarify that when someone sells a company for a lot of money, they, they really end up with all the money that they, uh, <laughs> The, of the valuation of the company that they sold it for. Um, right. Because there's usually a lot of other people in the mix, not not just mm -hmm. you. Um, but yeah, to, to answer your question, Karina, the we have launched a venture capital fund on the on the basis of um, selling our own company. And we're investing today in female entrepreneurs in Africa. And our big focus is how do we address inequality as a mm -hmm. as an issue of our time? Um, and we're focused on inequality in the sense of uh, gender inequality, race inequality, and geography inequality. And so for us, access to capital is really critical for trying to level the playing field. Who gets mm -hmm. access to capital? What opportunities do people have? How do you, how do you move forward? And how do we diversely move our forward by how, how we deploy our capital? Because where our money flows determines what we build and, and right. how we shape our world. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I know I shouldn't have said like that hundred million is not like you got all of it, of course. <laughs> Cause I wish. you do, you, no, yeah. No, no, no. <laughs> I, I was speaking to a, a gentleman, um, John LeFever. He, he was able to sell his company for, a fair amount of money and had a, th a third of a billion dollars as the result of that. And then ended up having to give a fair amount of it, of course, back to uh, the government for a number of reasons. Right. But um, that's a, a story for another day. He spent something like $50 million um, just in making donations to companies because he wanted to do good with his okay. money, which is just incredible. Fantastic. Yeah. So, um, so as it stands right now, you are still, I think, seeking a few partners to be part of this venture fund. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. We've been actively seeking great partners for the last couple of years as we've been starting to deploy capital in Africa. Um, mm -hmm. And today, I think we've almost deployed about $10 million um, across, um, I think we've done about 15 companies now um, over the last 18 months. Uh, two years. We started investing at the very beginning of 2020. So yeah, we are 
actively engaged in empowering, educating, mentoring, coaching, and investing in women-led businesses that are highly scalable and highly impactful in their nations. So tell us about one of those companies, just as a, for example, like what made you seek to invest in them? Like what, what really stood out to you? And if anything, anybody listening here, you know, might get something out of that and choose to, to seek the right partner to help them grow their business as well. Yeah. I mean, there are so many companies I could talk about that we've invested in, but maybe I'll just pick one or two. Um, one of the, I mean, they all excite me in different ways for different reasons. Um, one of the ones that springs to mind first um, is a company in Zambia. In fact, we've got two companies in Zambia, but one of those companies um, is a seeking to become a neo bank, um, a new version of a digital bank to create access to banking services for the unbanked. So hmm. many of you may or may not know, but Africa has huge numbers of people who are still considered to be unbanked which which doesn't mean they don't have any money it means they aren't using or have access to banking services um, and so trying to create opportunities for more and more people to access banking services um, and support banking activities and money transfers and savings mm -hmm. and loans um, and access to capital is a is a another piece of the puzzle uh, for them. So one of the companies we've invested in um, is actively deploying loans, loan personal loans and business loans, and creating savings products and loan products for people who are typically underserved um, and have, have little access to capital. So that's pretty wow. exciting. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think the statistics are pretty stark too. There are several countries around the world where it's difficult for women to get funding, period, or even to get bank accounts, mm -hmm. or there are laws that impede that too. So I'm unfamiliar with the laws in Zambia, but I think in my um, opening, I'd said in South Africa. So you're, um, you're lending more, or you're fu funding companies more broadly. Hmm? Yes, uh, across Southern and Eastern Africa is our focus at the moment, yeah. Okay, because when I read South Africa, I think I was um, specifically thinking of only the country of South Africa. So mm -hmm. um, it's a good clarification point. Now, as far as how you brought this company through the process, I mean, did you like bring them under your arm and really show them what they would need to prepare? Or was it something where you, you know, received the standard deck from uh, a set of companies and reviewed them like that? I just wonder if it's different than how other VCs are running things. It's definitely different. Yes. I mean, a traditional VC in the US, for example, would typically only look at a deck if they had an introduction from an introduction for somebody. You'd maybe be networked right. with a person or you might get an introduction from someone you know who would introduce you to somebody you know. Mm -hmm. um, so getting your deck in front of a VC um, in the US is, is challenging. Um, mm -hmm. And one of, the, one of the hard pieces about that for me as a female founder was I just felt like if you weren't networked or belonging to the right social social spheres um, or, you know, coming from a particular uh, educational background that, you know, you had access to VCs visiting your MBA class, for example, mm -hmm. um, you would be unlikely to get in front of the right people. And one of the things that I felt so strongly about with raising my own funding for my own company was that We've got to democratize access. It shouldn't be about where you went to school or what socioeconomic background you're from or which country you live in um, as to whether your country gets a lot of venture capital or not. Um, we should be creating access on the basis of brilliant ideas by brilliant people, right? Brilliant, brilliance should be the, the criteria, not whether, you, whether you've had a particular educational background or particular financial background and so one of the first things we did when we launched Enigma was that we hold open applications um, which means you don't have to know me or be networked with me or get an introduction from someone who knows me you can create an app you can go on our website and um, we hold application periods three times a year and you can apply 
um, and you have to follow answer you know four or five basic questions about your business which just gives us an overview tell us show us your website if you've got a deck great if you don't have a deck okay we'll help you build one um, and we quickly realized that we need to help people learn the language of the system because there's a system there's a way this works there's there's specific things that venture capitalists look for and and are looking for and uh, we have to if we want to see diversity in the mix we've got to open up the the floodgates to allow people more opportunities to understand how they can play the game too um, and so over the last couple of years we've been very active with helping people understand the metrics that matter helping people create decks um, that tell great stories um, and helping people understand how to think about their businesses differently. How do you go from thinking about building a small business to, to thinking about how do I build a vehicle that's really scalable and that could actually become quite big? That was well, a I'm so glad. Of no, but it's, <laughs> it's really important. I, I mean, I'm just sitting here thinking about what I was exposed to in graduate school. And I mean, there's really, it's a formula. And even when you're talking to some of the bigger funds, um, like Sierra, as a, for example, they, they really, if they get submitted 200 different presentations or decks to consider for a meeting, and that's consider for a meeting, they seriously mm -hmm. look at five out of those 200. And, yeah. and that's, you know, a really small number. And so one of my, um, the members of my, and a, a later cohort, but somebody I connected with in a few classes, Amit Jamwar, he started this fund or this company called Connects Up, um, C-O-N-E-X-U-P, specifically designed to help people navigate all of the challenges that they might face trying to see VCs and get the funding they need. Because in his mind, it's like the yeah. founders is where the founders need to have some power, they need to have some voice, and they need to have some guidance. And too often, they end up either accepting a deal that's not good for them, and that will end in them essentially losing long term, or that they will not get the funding that they need to actually see the success that they would be able to if they had the proper funding. And so, I mean, the fact that there is a company like that starting out in Silicon Valley tells you there's a problem already, right? Yeah. And uh, yeah. so. Yeah. It's called Shark Tank things... for a reason, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, come in here. The, the water's nice. There might be sharks in it, right? <laughs> That's basically the yeah. feeling I think we all have. Um, so, so let's talk for a moment about the funding that these female led companies get versus don't get, like, let's look at the United States for, for an example, what mm. percentage mm. of uh, female led bu businesses generally get funded in the U S do you have any idea about what those statistics are? Um, unfortunately I do. It's been let, it's been about 2% for the last 20 years and it's barely budged an inch. Um, so 2% two, 2 out of 100% of all the venture capital funding is going to women-led businesses in the U.S. Yeah, that's just, it's maddening. <laughs> See, I had hoped that it had moved. Uh, it hasn't moved. That's the scary thing. It hasn't moved. And there was a, I saw a meme going out last, uh, earlier this year, actually, it was uh, when all the Robin Hood stuff was happening with the um, GameStop. And there was a, a note saying that more funding went into that one company than had gone to all female founders in the in the entire previous year or something. I mean, it just it was crazy, and it and it just brings it home of just how little funding women are are attracting and getting, um, which invariably for me really means we that influences the world we're building, right? And if right, you think about the backbone of what builds a, our nation or nations it's small businesses right it's it's the stuff where money flows and, and where what we build um and where venture capital goes is so influential if you think about even the last decade and we, with all the tech advantages that have happened over the last 10 years you know my kids can't can't imagine a world without ipads and iphones for example um and so 
social media is, an, is another one over the last decade. And it's like what we, where we put money, you know, where we determine where money is going to flow is, is going to determine the kind of world that we build. And mm -hmm. you know, at the moment, you know, and for many decades prior to this moment, we've had a very unequal um, distribution of where funding flows, which, which means we're only going to solve certain problems. We're only going to tackle certain challenges. We're only going to innovate in particular ways because of a particular demographic with a particular viewpoint, with a particular vision of our, all of our futures. And so for me, it's absolutely critical that we think about investing diversely and not just gender, but race and geography also, mm -hmm. because people are going from different places with different eyes, with different backgrounds, from different races are going to solve different problems. Um, and we collectively need to solve problems that move us all forward. Um, and so that really motivates us to, to think about how we invest and where we allow capital to flow. Wow. Well, I'm still reeling over the 2%. I had hoped it had at least gone up a couple points in the last few years. I think it's almost like I have blinders on about it too, because I would prefer to think that we're in a different world where there are more female leaders and CEO seats, yet only 4% of uh, Fortune 500 companies are led by women. And, you know, these are the statistics yeah. that I think make it very apparent that we have a long, long way to come. And um, we definitely do. a huge way to go. I was shocked by a new statistic that I had never realized until earlier this year, which was that only something like it was either 24 or 26, can't remember the exact number, but only say 24 female founders have ever taken their company public in the US. 24. It's like in the history of companies, companies going public, that's how many women have, have taken companies public. So We've definitely got a long way to go um, and definitely still got a lot of work to do in terms of um, moving the needle and thinking about what really will move the needle to enable women um, to, to get a seat at the table. And what's so interesting is the statistics support female-led organizations. Generally speaking, women-led organizations tend to be more profitable. They tend to have lower... Um, <laughs> what do you call it? a lower turnover rate so that means that they're able to retain employees for longer and so if you're looking at profitability and you're looking at employee retention as two markers for the potential success of a company why would you not also seek out more female in head leadership positions and i think sadly a lot of it still has to do with the fact that we have wombs um because these are the things i hear from people even when we have a um <laughs> let's just say a presidential candidate running for office. Oh, well, I don't want to vote for a woman in office. She'll have her finger on the nuclear arsenal. And what if she had a bad PMS day or something like that? And this kind of latent challenge that we see within our society is, I mean, I, I consider it shocking every time I hear these sorts of things, but yeah, you know, it seems like it's par for the course. And, uh, so I, I try to be hopeful and I try to think, okay, well, you know, we just keep putting one foot in front of the other. We fund or support more women led businesses. And it means that in some cases I even seek out women led businesses more so than I would men, even if there's a male led company that does the job a little bit better from a personal perspective, I'm more likely to want to give my business to the women led organization because I'm aware of these statistics. Um, and so, you know, thankfully a lot of great companies are starting to come out of, uh, the ether, so to speak, like I'm using mighty networks to run a community and it's female led. They have a female CEO, female co-founder, they are backed by venture capital and, you know, they're emerging now in the Silicon Valley. Um, there's another example in the podcasting community where I just brought my podcast over to their platform and that's Podetize. And they are primarily female owned and the female CEO and the female CEO seat. I mean, I, because I see that this challenge is something that we have to continue to work through. We have to think about the choices we're making. If we want to see a world where there is true equality, then we have to also support businesses that are 
female and minority owned and led in order to move in that direction. Because otherwise we just get kind of stuck and we'll make a little progress, but it's like one step forward, two steps back to quote Paula Abdul. <laughs> Absolutely. And I think it's also coming to the realization of why inequality is a problem. I think because many of us who consider consider ourselves privileged or maybe don't even consider ourselves privileged, but actually really are, because I do consider myself very privileged, it's it's understanding why inequality is not good for us all. And and what harm are we actually doing to ourselves long term and for my children and their great grandchildren and their children and their children, etc. And how are we how are we building our world? And why does it matter? And, and I think when we really grapple with why equality matters, because bear in mind, we're not, we're not talking about flipping the tables here. We're not talking about uh, women, some men only getting 2% of venture capital, or, <laughs> you know, we're not, we're not talking about such, we're trying to just level with the playing field. Um, so that, you know, you know, we are not building a world the only only where white men rule and why white, white men thrive and that's that's unfortunately where we're at right now and you know we are woefully aware how perilously a, a threat our our world is from climate change mm-hmm. um, sustainability has never been more important and yet we're hurtling hurtling we continue to hurtle in the direction that will only see us implode. We've had the unfortunate disaster of the last 24 months of dealing with a pandemic, which Mm -hmm. has hurt and harmed people of color, people of lower demographic social um, status even more. Um, And and we keep seeing more variants and, uh, you know, popping up. Uh, But how do we, how do we, how do we build so that we, we are building a world that that is viable for everyone and is sustainable and isn't continuing us on a path towards ultimate you know doom and gloom and and that's really what the fight for inequality is about it's not it's not just that women are fed up of you know washing dishes and looking after children and you know changing diapers that that isn't it we we still want to have children and we still want to raise families and we still care about mm-hmm. um, looking at homes, it's like none of those things changed. It's just, you know, we, for me, it, it's about how we're building a, a better world and what that looks like. Yeah, I mean, I can't agree more. Um, and as a mom of two boys, I mean, it's not like I want to see them fail over somebody else. I, I don't want that for anybody. Mm-hmm. But I want them to look at the women and their lives as equals to them. And if we don't build a society that looks at women equally, then the chance of them getting there, even if I raise them right and give them all the right, uh, you know, guidance along the way, they're affected by how their community sees women too. Like we don't raise children alone. And so I, I just think Absolutely. that more and more we need to think about the, 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 the way that we're constructing to society and if we've constructed a society that only looks at what the end dollar is going to be, the profitability that runs business from a very extraction oriented perspective, then we run out of resources and suddenly we yeah. aren't going to have what we need to, to build the tools we need or to have a, a thriving economy and a thriving environment at the same time. I mean, we're already seeing the problems associated with having run things from a very extractive perspective for generations. So, um, you know, the types of solutions that we need, I think are going to come from collaboration with all people, all genders and bringing more opportunity to people who come from different cultures will be really critical for that too. Even a lot of the solutions that we're seeing from a climate perspective are coming from indigenous uh, communities around the globe too. So I think elevating these voices, ensuring that people have equal opportunity are really critical. Now, I put you in touch with Lydia Camundo Blasire from 8B Education Investments. I got to interview her in one of my earlier podcasts. I want to say she was in like my first 10 or 15. 
And uh, she is working to bring equal access to education, uh, to world-class education for people of Africa. So I wondered if you'd had a chance to connect with her yet. We haven't chatted, chatted yet, but I'm very excited to, to chat with her. I'm, I'm headed back to South Africa next month. So when I'm back on mm. the continent, I'm looking forward to uh, having a phone call with her. Yeah. Well, the reality is I think she's, um, she's near Cornell, so she's in the States. Oh. Um, but, uh, yeah, having a chance to connect and, and just building more bridges between people who are working towards the same thing is something that I'm personally all about. And so I hope that you okay. two get a chance to connect and potentially collaborate as well. Um, there, I think is if we as a people and as a community start to look at where we can reach a handout and kind of raise up with one another that, um, you know, mm -hmm. we really will seek, we, we will achieve more because that's my core belief that together we can achieve so much more that together we can push for change. And because if we're all working in silos then then not as well, the work can't get done completely in silos anyway. So. So what's next it's for, for you? I mean, it, it takes a village. Sorry. It takes a village to make anything happen. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So uh, what, uh, what I was just getting to ask is, uh, what is next for you specifically with Enigma Ventures? Like, what do you have planned on the horizon? Yeah, we have our open call for applications open at the moment. So I am excited to look at um, a new cohort in January of, of entrepreneurs trying to make great big things happen. And I think the exciting part of, of always looking at decks and, and new companies is just seeing the vast amount of problems and challenges people are trying to tackle. Um, and the privileged position then of being able to go, let's back this one uh, and try mm -hmm. and solve this problem with them. Um, and so excited to um, to dig in and, and see see what other people are seeing and see the world through their eyes. I mean, I think that's been one of the most exciting things about doing work in Africa has been seeing the world through other people's eyes uh, and a non-Western eye in particular um, and looking, I, mean, I have learned so much. I personally feel like I've learned so much over the last 18 months. Um, I was joking with one of our investees just recently in that we've invested in her company that um, supplies black hair products and she has all sorts of um, hair extensions and some wigs um, and also black hair products. And I now feel like, wow, I know so much more about black hair. And I thought I understood curly hair, right? But I had no clue about how mm -hmm. black hair functions and how you attach things and the problems black women have with um, uh, with managing their hair um, and what's deemed socially acceptable styles and not socially acceptable styles <laughs> in certain places and certain times. And I was like, there's, mm -hmm. a whole, there's a whole new world out here I had never known about. So, um, there is there is so there is so much to be discovered um, by understanding the world's problems through other people's eyes, um, and so that's always super exciting um, as we start to dig into to some of the solutions that people are coming up with for problems that affect their communities and their cities and their nations. So you mentioned something that I think is really interesting. You referred to this group of people who will be seeking capital as a cohort. So that implies community. Mm. That implies that you connect them together. Is that something that's a part of your practice? Do you connect the different companies that you are investing in together? Yes, very much so. I think for me, that's been one of, maybe for them also, but has been one of the most joyful things about investing. And my own experience as a, a female founder was it was very lonely. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until quite late in my entrepreneurship journey that I met other female entrepreneurs you know trying to do crazy things like I was um, <laughs> and so we we meet our portfolio companies come together every single month um, where we have a, a group learning session together where they can all join um, we talk about topics that are relevant for them bringing guest speakers teachers on certain items of, of 
they're all at the same kind of stage. So they're all struggling with the same kinds of things and trying to solve the same kind of problems, even though their businesses will be completely different. And so the value of being connected with each other and journeying with each other, being able to ask each other questions, you know, one company might be further ahead in one thing than another thing. So they have their own WhatsApp group that they, they chat about. So you put um, them each in they, a, I mean, essentially you've done this, you've created cohorts of the investment community. So every time you go through a season, you connect them to one another, and then they basically are able to develop strong relationships with other people building different companies, maybe in competing spaces, but likely not. Right. Yep. Yep. That's really cool. Exactly. And we, we just hosted our first in-person retreat uh, in September, um, which was so exciting to have them all together in person. Cause obviously we've all been living in a very virtual world the last two years. Um, but having, having them together and spending time together um, was amazing. The energy in the room, and enthusiasm was just really quite extraordinary. And just this idea of if she can do it, I can do it. And if I can do it, mm -hmm. she can do it. Um, and of championing each other. Um, super powerful. Now, are you personally on the board of any of the companies that you're helping to fund? Yeah. Um, someone from my team is on every board um, mm -hmm. of the company that we funded. I think I'm on about eight boards so far, which is more than enough. Uh, but yeah. the number is rising. Um uh, but yes, so we we regularly uh, meet monthly and usually quarterly as a larger group. Well, I love that. Well, see, we just uncovered one of the aspects of your uh, venture capital firm that is different from many of them. And that whole cohort cohort's perspective, I think, is really great. Yeah, it's it's been a it's been a real blessing for everyone, I think, actually, including us, um, because mm -hmm. there's so many unexpected advantages of 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 learning in it when being in community. And we all know when we're in a community of some kind, there's there's lots of unforeseen benefits of being in relationship mm -hmm. with other human beings on a journey similar to yourself. And so that's been very powerful. And I think for women also, um, because we tend to be more relationally driven, it's a really mm -hmm. valuable tool um, for feeling like you are connected and you're not alone um, and that other people are on the same journey that you are on. You can journey journey with them. So I think that's has been a huge, huge differentiator. Um, but also, I, you know, I would love it not to be a differentiator because I would love it to be normal um, right. and it to be the way that investors interact and so our engagement is more you know it's definitely about trying to understand what's happening in the business and what's financially happening in the business but there's so much more to it um, in terms of what we hope will drive ultimate success and and breakthroughs uh, for our companies wow so I imagine that that experience is anathema to what you had when you were funded. Um, if you want to speak to that. Uh, <laughs> I have had, well, I, I just think it's helpful. Investment. How many, how many people yeah, actually have uh, been through the, the whole, whole thing? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's an unusual journey for sure. And almost anyone you speak to will say they've had some great investors and they've had some not great investors. Mm -hmm. um, so my, my, my experience is, is definitely not unique. Um, but the interesting thing about what makes great investors great from an entrepreneurial perspective, I think is actually really simple. Um, and it is relational um, and supportive. Mm -hmm. And I know I, I turned an early venture capitalist down when we were first went out to raise capital and I, uh, I had taken months and maybe even a year to try and get a term sheet to the table. I mean, it was so painful, but I remember we just faced this horrible decision that no one ever really wants to face because, you know, our business desperately needed capital. But at the same time, we knew that the guys that we'd got a term sheet from, they felt like bullies. Um, mm. You know, and I mentioned the, the shark word, um, mm -hmm. earlier but I just knew I couldn't be in relationship with these people I, I knew I desperately like even though you money, needed the money and my business, yeah 
my business was was on the verge of I had no idea how I was going to pay payroll, for example, the next month. Mm-hmm. Um, that that short of capital, you know, we were really on a knife edge. Um, and being offered a term sheet for seven million dollars and feeling like oh, all our problems will be answered if we if we put some money in the pot and we'll have better cash flow and we'll have great investors at the table. But I just realized um, I it, finding investors is a bit like getting married, really. Um, you're in it for the long <laughs> haul together. It's not a it's not a one night stand. It's not it's not a quick fling. It's a journey that you go on together. And so the relational piece of investing, um, I think it's true for men and women, to be honest, but I know it's especially true for women. But I I knew I couldn't do a deal with people who felt like they were going to be beating me up every month. And, you know, this, uh, that I was on my own and I still had Mm -hmm. to just keep delivering results and keep them happy. And the, this one gentleman who shall be name, name, nameless, um, while we were closing our, doing all the diligence and closing our deal, I called him up one day and said, I've got a problem with one of our camps. We're opening a new camp. I have a glam, had a glamping company. We're opening a new location. There's been a problem with the sale of the land. I'm, I'm sorting it out, but I just wanted to give you a heads up. There was a problem. And he said to me, that will be very bad for you if you don't solve that. If you don't fix that, this is not going to go well for you. And I, I, I could like barely understand what he was telling me because I was like, I was calling you to tell you there is a problem, but I'm sorting it out and I will deal with it. But I needed to give you the heads up that something's going down. And he treated me like I was... Totally like your head would roll. Mm-hmm. Like I will be fired from my own mm-hmm. company that he's becoming a minority investor in that if if this you know situation goes down. And I was like, what is happening here? <laughs> it was like it was such like this parallel universe. I was like, this this doesn't this doesn't make any sense. But it's it's just started me re- waking me up to the reality that um investing is about more than cash it's Mm -hmm. bringing an investor into your company is is more than having a healthy it's more than having a healthy balance sheet and that actually great investors and there are definitely many um Mm -hmm. who, who add value who are supportive who can who can help expedite your journey help get you where you're supposed to go quicker who can open doors for you and help make things happen Um, and provide expertise above and beyond um, making your cash position look better. And I I think, you know, the the position that, you know, the investor is there to just make money from you is a misnomer in every which way. And so often venture capital gets boiled down to that, right? That, you know, investors are about trying to make 10 times on their money. When actually, you know, a great investor will invest a huge amount of themselves in you, um, not just by giving you cash, but also by Mm -hmm. um, supporting, directing you, definitely telling you hard truths at times, but also being supportive in the bad moments uh, and helping you get back up when it feels feels like all is lost. Um, And so, yeah, my 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 experience was was has formed um, Mm -hmm. the investor that. I hope I am now and, and will continue to become and, and really encourage me to get in, in the ring in the first place with realizing more women need to be at the table. More women need to be making decisions about who gets capital and who doesn't, which problems get solved and which, which ones don't. Um, and, and how can we enable more women to change that stat uh, that only 2% are getting funded? How can we break some through some of these ceilings and, and see more women become super successful? Because I think it matters. Well, I think it matters too. And I think part of the reason I asked you that question a bit ago about how many of the boards you were on, you've funded 15 businesses and you're on the boards of more than half of them. Personally, it speaks to your emotional and intellectual commitment to each of these companies as well. And definitely shows how you stand out. 
So I think it's to be commended and I personally admire you and what you're doing with Enigma Ventures. That's incredible. So keep up the great work. Thank you. Thank you. I think, I think the emotional piece can, can definitely be a flaw at some times in terms of, um, I don't want any of my companies to fail. And the stats that venture, you know, venture typically sees is that, um, many, many investments will fail. Um, mm -hmm. and you end up with a few that are, you know, unicorns or do exceptionally well. That's typically how venture investing works that mm -hmm. one out of 10 might be a home run. Right. And the hard part about that for me, is I don't want any of my investments to fail. I want them all to succeed and, and have the opportunity to, to do extraordinarily well. So, well, perhaps uh, they will. Maybe that's, maybe that's the hard part. But that trend too. Maybe we can beat that. Maybe, maybe we can. <laughs> well, it's the hope. And uh, I personally think you might see a different statistic because of how you're running things. So, I, I'm sure time will tell, and I look forward to hearing of your first unicorn. Tell. Yeah, yeah. Well, really I look incredible. To that day too. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, is there a question that you wish I'd asked that I perhaps haven't, or some thought that you'd like to leave our audience with? Oh, great question! You asked some great questions today, Karina. Um, <laughs> that you haven't asked. Um, what do you what do you think this is not really the, something you haven't asked but the question for you really is like what do you think um your listeners would really like to know from me that you haven't asked is there would there be a burning question that um maybe you think they might uh like to know the answer to that we haven't touched on well i think you know once once you've attained extreme wealth. I mean, anything over you know, a few million dollars is kind of, it's extreme wealth. Like you have yes, the assets you need to retire tomorrow. Um, and I think yes. they may have got an inkling of why you are committed to this and, and staying at the hard work. But the moment you're on eight boards, I can tell you you're working full-time plus plus right now. Like you are invested, mm -hmm. you're doing a lot. And um, so why? That's a great question. So I, I, the interesting thing, I think that many people often think about making a lot of money is um, that it will be satisfying. Um, and yes, I do like making money. I, 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 it, there's something about um, achieving things that drives me. But I think more than that, I learned a long time ago Money is a byproduct. Um, it's a byproduct of, of doing something great and something. Um, and, and there are lots of things that you can do that are great that don't have money as a byproduct. But I think the most satisfied and most fulfilled people in the world, which I think is different than success. Um, for me, your ultimate success is really about living a life that feels fulfilling to you. And being true to yourself and true to the things that are inside of you. Because we all, we all, all of us have things inside of us that drive us or we're passionate about or that we love um, and that are meaningful to us. And so I think for me, what drives me is feeling like I am on the journey to fulfill a greater mission. Um, mm -hmm. And I, when our funds hit, when we closed our deal with Under Canvas, um, I ended up with a stomach bug for my children. So we never really <laughs> got the chance to celebrate for any any moment of time. But I went back to work, right? It was like I got up, you know, a few days later after having had the worst stomach bug of my life um, <laughs> and went back to work and carried on with the mission of our business. and. It, it not that it didn't change anything because it changed lots of things um but the core heart of what drives me to get out of bed every day did not change um it just gave me more resources to do the th things that i care about um mm -hmm. and to to try and make an impact on and so the why the why is because i have a mission and because there's a 
there's a piece of my soul that is connected to um, wanting to be part of building a better world and moving us forward. And I, and I think we all have a role to play in that. And we all get to contribute, you know, a sort of a, a teeny piece. Um, but if we all play our part, we, we make a better world. And I truly believe that. I truly believe it's possible to drive change. I truly believe, you know, and we all have very discouraging, very difficult dark days. But I ultimately believe that I can make a difference um, and that getting up every day and uh, choosing to be true, true to my own inner compass um, will not only be fulfilling and satisfying, but actually will lead to le living a happier, uh, happier life. Well, thank you for that. I think that's very inspirational. And ultimately, I think I have the same viewpoint. So it's, uh, it's refreshing to see consistently from people in the community I'm building that they care about the same things. And so I'm honored to have had the opportunity to tell your story here. Where can our community go to find out more about you and what you're doing with Enigma Ventures? Yeah, you can find me on LinkedIn. I'm a, I'm a passionate networker on LinkedIn. So I'm on Sarah Dusick, LinkedIn. Um, and also on our website, Enigma Ventures. Uh, Enigma is spelled with a Y, E-N-Y-G-M-A. EnigmaVentures.com. Uh, and we're right there. Great. Well, I will be sure to include these links along with show notes so people can find you and hear from you directly if they have questions about how they might seek to find that venture capital when they're ready for it. Um, personally, I'm very glad to be connected to you and I just wish you all the best in your ventures in Africa, South and Eastern Africa. I think it's a good place to funnel money. So very good. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure to be here. And thank you for building the community uh, of people that you are building and uh, connecting people who care about the same things. It's fantastic. Thank you. Awesome. Now, listeners, it's time for me to ask you something simple. It's time to act. That action could be as small as sharing this podcast with someone in your community that you think needs to hear it. Or it could be going to Enigma Ventures and exploring what they're doing and the good work that they're putting into the world. To find more suggestions, you can always visit caremorebebetter.com, sign up for our newsletter, get that five tips and activist guide. And as always, thank you now and always for being a part of this pod and this community, because together we really can do so much more. We can care more and we can be better. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Care More, Be Better, a podcast for social good. To make sure you never miss an episode, subscribe, rate, and review wherever you listen to podcasts. And share with your friends to help us reach more people and spread more social good.